It bewilders me to this day how much better Black Lagoon is than every other anime. This is my top 5 anime, and I love Evangelion and I love Cowboy Bebop to death, their density and girth of things to say is unrivaled in anime, but even with their thematic density and overall quality, they don't even hold a candle to Black Lagoon to me. And if you think this is all about action, you're a complete fool. Because Rock and Revy are the best anime relationship. I've written over 50,000 words about this relationship. I accumulated what I thought were all of my thoughts into a four-part video series here on YouTube, two of which are still available to view on my channel, but here I am in the same year, coming back because there's more to say. Black Lagoon is the greatest anime of all time because Rock and Revy's relationship is the best anime relationship. And Rock and Revy is the best anime relationship because of Black Lagoon's unmatched character writing. The sheer number of layers of subtext there is between these two is almost too immense to comprehend because you have to incorporate everything that Revy is and then clash it with everything that Rock is, and seeing them collide is the magic this series stands on. But the heart of this relationship before we get into the thematic writing of the characters is how they interact. The dub is essential to the quality of their interactions. You must, and I mean must, watch Black Lagoon dub. Because everything I talk about in this video only works because of the quality of the changed dub specific script. Because dialogue to me is the number one thing I look for in media. My favourite TV show of all time, Black Lagoon included, is The Sopranos. My favourite film of all time is either The Godfather Part 1 or Part 2. And my favourite video game of all time is The Last of Us. One thing that all of these things excel in is their collective great dialogue. The Sopranos has the best dialogue I've ever heard on TV. The Godfather has the best dialogue I've ever heard in film. And The Last of Us has the best dialogue I've ever heard in a game. Black Lagoon's dub is the only anime I would even consider putting in the same category in terms of dialogue as these various things. Cowboy Bebop can try, but Black Lagoon does it better. Bakano can try, but Black Lagoon does it better. The Black Lagoon dub is so brutal and raw and blunt. The performances are great, but they are working with what they've been given. The lines they are given feel natural and feel at home in the setting. It makes sense that Rowanapa would lead to the most foul-mouthed anime script in existence. Find me another anime that uses the word cunt, and as a proud Australian, I'll give you an award. It's time to go teach this fucking cunt the meaning of pain. The swearing in this show absolutely makes a difference, because it's something anime always senses and dubs. But Black Lagoon fully leans into it, and it definitely makes the dialogue feel more natural, it makes it funnier, and it makes it more quotable. I point this out all the time, but the dismissive fuck you Revy throws back at Rock in the submarine gives me euphoria on each listen. It's perfect, and it perfectly encapsulates the point I'm trying to make here. And again, the dialogue is what everything we are about to get into stands on. All the deep character related stuff is paltry to me if they are unnatural in the way they portray it, because if there's one thing that anime certainly isn't, it's subtle. Naruto explains exactly how he did what he just did, because anime largely thinks its audience are morons. Black Lagoon does not hold your hand. The dialogue does not tell you what's going on, but it does portray what is going on. And that's what we call subtlety. So now let's explain why all these layers make Rock and Revy the best relationship in anime. Rock and Revy are almost never honest with each other, in fact it's impossible for them to be honest with each other because they can't even be honest with themselves. There are only a few things certain about their relationship, they definitely care about each other and they definitely tread on each other. That's almost all that's certain between the two of them. And this is perfect because that's what people do. In fact, they take it even a step further because they constantly act in contradiction to what they actually want. To set up the entirety of this video, all I had to do was explore two questions. What does Revy want, and what does Rock want? The answers to these questions are incredibly complex and I'm not even sure the characters could answer the questions themselves if they were asked, but I definitely think that they think they can answer it about the other person, particularly Revy to Rock. Revy sees Rock as the epitome of a normal man with a normal life and both admires him and hates him for this. She takes advantage of this and on the exterior acts like she wants him to change, only for him to change and then for her heart to break because of it. By the end of Roberta's blood trail, Rock is no longer a 
normal man with a normal life, and Revy breaks when she is confronted with this truth through his behaviour in those OVAs. She even tries to kill him for the first time since episode 7 in the iconic cigarette kiss scene. Even before that with the equally iconic submarine scene, she wanted to kill him for judging her from his normie perspective. She couldn't handle being questioned and couldn't stand that someone who didn't know what it was like to be born into this thing would judge her and morally chastise her for earning money. And then when Rock finally comes over to her side and acts like her, the way she wanted him to do back in episode 7 in Roberta's blood trail with his manipulation of everybody, including her, she wants to kill him again. He stood opposite of her and she wanted to kill him. He stood parallel to her and she wanted to kill him. And this is all because Revy is a hypocrite. She berated him the entire show, calling him a pussy and saying that he wasn't cut out for this thing, but then he showed her that he was, and she hated him for that as well. This happened because Revy doesn't know what she wants. She gives off different signals and never actually explains what she wants from Rock. Because she can't, and even if she could, I don't think she would tell him because that's not how humans work. Does she, like Fabiola said in Roberta's Blood Trail, view Rock as her knight in shining armour? Does she want Rock to remain a morally virtuous normal person in the hopes that he can one day save her from the only life she's ever known in Rowanna for stealing and killing? Is this why she gets so angry and has such an existential crisis at the end of Roberta's Blood Trail when it looks like Rock is going to lose himself to the city and to the game? Is this why she pleads with him to look at her as Yukio commits suicide in the most brutal way possible by impaling herself? I think this is what Revy wants, which funnily enough makes Revy a completely fucked up damsel in distress. She sees Rock as an out and a representation of a better life, and the more she and the city chip away at that, the more scared she gets. But what's even more interesting from Revy's perspective is that she doesn't notice Rock is changing throughout the show. She blinds herself and only sees what she wants to see in Rock. Even by the time we get to Japan, and even in Roberta's blood trail, she's still repeating the stupid talking point that he doesn't belong in this thing. The twins going to Japan and everything that happens there, and then the events of Roberta's blood trail have all had a massive effect on Rock. He's obviously changed since the beginning of the story when he was a simple, morally virtuous Japanese man. Fabiola and Roberta's blood trail serves as a brutal reality check to Revy in this regard, because she's the one who finally makes her see Rock for who he truly is. The conceit of the series, the sales line for this series, would seem to be what happens when a morally virtuous Japanese man is thrust into the underworld and forced to confront it, with the key dynamic being his relationship with this girl who represents all the underworld has to offer. It's supposed to be the interesting interactions of these two polar opposites interacting, but what's truly brilliant about all of this is that by the time Roberta's blood trail comes around, we realise that the point of this series was actually to show that the normal Japanese Japanese man, this relatable main character, the representation of you in the narrative is actually exactly the same as this girl, this representation of the underworld. Because everyone is capable of becoming like Revy, as Rock does in Roberta's Blood Trail. Fabiola serves as the holy messenger for Revy and the audience. She's the wake up slap that Revy needed. Fabiola in this scene tells Revy that this person she always talks about, this person that doesn't belong in this thing, the person who isn't cut out for it, she's never met. Because because the rock she's always known in her short experience in Roanapa absolutely belongs here. He's indistinguishable to her from the rest of the filth in the city. It's also entirely possible that that person Revy had projected onto Rock never existed to begin with, because the point is that the filth of Roanapa is in every person. Just only some have to bring it out of themselves to survive, and Roanapa is a place that brings this side out of people. Fabiola then ends the scene making the analogy that Revy wants Rock to be her knight in shining armour, and because of all this subtext I think she's absolutely right. Revy literally has an existential breakdown after this conversation that leads her into the mindset of wanting to kill Rock again. The value she secretly thought Rock had is gone, and she's extremely angry in that moment, and then she goes to talk to Rock and he's a zombie. He's so steadfast in his ploy at this point that even though the person he's perhaps closest to in the entire world is sitting there having just been broken and gone through a retroactive depression where she relived getting raped as a child, he stands there emotionless and unsupportive. The person Revy wanted him to be is gone in that moment, and it's almost all her fault, because she berated him the entire time for being the person she always wanted him to be. Because that's another very important layer to all of this. Revy never says anything even approaching what she actually means, or what she actually wants from Rock. So it's hard to blame Rock for not seeing it. And here's the thing, Revy is a total sundere. She's only mean to him because she likes him and doesn't know how to properly communicate with him, because that's how humans are. 
by the way, that does also make Revy the best Sundere in anime as well, if we're keeping score here. Sorry, Asuka. To portray what Rock and Revy's relationship is like to the people who may still be struggling to understand me here, let me give a totally not personal analogy that puts everything into perspective. Let's say a young boy likes a young girl and they are in school together. They sit next to each other, let's say. Now the young boy can't just come out and say that he likes the young girl because he doesn't have confidence in the fact that she likes him back or wants the same thing that he does. If she asks and she doesn't, then the game is lost forever. So it's best to try another approach. He decides to talk to her, but how they communicate is almost contradictory to the young boy's goal. They get to talking, but the young boy is a little nervous, so he alleviates this with comedy and other chemistry building things. What eventuates from their relationship is the young boy constantly and jokingly making fun of the young girl because it's funny and it makes both of them laugh, and it's clearly playful between the two of them. It's the whole he only picks on you because he likes you shtick. That's what their relationship is built on, and it's fun, and now they always have something to talk about and it's easy to talk to each other, because they have built this chemistry. But then a problem arises. The young boy still likes the young girl, probably even more now that there's more of a connection there. But because their relationship is built on sarcasm to a degree, and a whole lot of making fun of each other, the young boy might actually find himself further away from his original goal. How is he going to get serious all of a sudden and tell the young girl how he feels, when it's easier to just make her laugh and put off the serious part? He's never even hinted towards his true motivations, and if he reveals them, it could confuse the young girl, because nothing he's ever said has indicated that he likes her. If he tells her and their relationship is built on him making fun of her constantly, how can he then reveal that she was actually perfect the entire time and he just wanted her attention? He thought getting her attention would get him closer to his overall goal, at least closer than not talking to her at all. Ultimately, even though the young boy started all of this in order to express that he liked the young girl, he can now never come out and say it because it's impossible to read it from the other side. If he comes out and tells her, then everything they've built will either pay off or everything will be ruined. And now there's even more pressure than there was originally on what the response would be, if he was honest. It's possible that the young girl might be under the assumption that the young boy hates her. Does he only talk to her to make fun of her? She's got to ask herself these questions. And how could she possibly know that he was just nervous the entire time, and this dynamic was just the easiest way to talk to her? It's a hard situation all around, and if you haven't caught on yet, Revy is the young boy in this example. Instead of Revy liking the young girl, she wants the young girl, or Rock in the example, to save her from her lifelong tragedy, but she can never admit it because of who she is and how she got into this mess. Could you ever see Revy admitting this to Rock? It seems antithetical to everything she is, but the evidence is very clear. This is what Revy wants, and Fabiola is the only person that's had the balls to point this out. Revy will likely never admit this, but it is her true motivation, even if she acts in a completely contradictory manner. Just as the young boy acts in a contradictory manner towards the young girl. And this naturally creates some confusion in Rock. But this is what makes their dynamic so unbearably brilliant. There are so many layers here to analyse, and we haven't even begun to talk about anything from Rock's perspective yet. The conceit of Rock as a character is that he is the normal, morally virtuous man that is thrown into the underworld, and has to deal with what he finds there. We briefly went over this already. This leads down many winding roads, from the Nazis and the confrontation with Revy in the submarine, to the massive blow up in the cigarette kiss scene in episode 7, to the terrorist group kidnapping, to everything that happens with the twins, then with Yukio, and by the time we get to Roberta's blood trail, Rock is completely at wit's end, and that's when we see the most change in him. But that change is facilitated in every incremental arc we just went over that slowly chips away at his humanity. But here's the thing, quote-unquote normal rock is a lie. He's truly selfish and prideful in his own way, and is exactly like Revy. Again, we sort of went over this earlier, but I want to highlight here how selfish and prideful Rock is, outside of the fact that it brilliantly makes him exactly the same as Revy. This is most on display when he feels the need to reiterate his fucking stupid point to Yukio before she kills himself. He ignores the tragedy of the act and watches as she impales herself with Genji's samurai sword. But the most brilliant and frustrating thing about Rock throughout this whole arc is that he's massively hypocritical here. Because the way he sees Yukio is exactly the same way that Revy sees him, and he hates the way Revy sees him, yet he does the exact same thing to Yukio. 
Yukio and Genji may be the most blatant Rock and Revy parallels, though nearly every antagonist and every minor character is a direct parallel to one of the two of them. It's something that makes Rock and Revy so special. Think about it, Kageyama is what Rock would have become if he had remained in Japan and lived a normal life. He would have had a nice family, a dog, and been thoroughly unfulfilled with his repetitive day-to-day -day life. Takanaka, one of the leaders of the terrorist organization, is an example of what Rock could have turned into if he went all the way with this thing. Rock's smart enough and has enough guts to have radical men follow him. Takanaka serves as an underrated character in the series and a mirror to how Rock could have ended up if he applied himself fully to the underworld. Kageyama is the version of Rock that went all the way this way, and Takanaka is the version of Rock that went all the way this way. And as Rock usually does, he ends up in the twilight between these two opposites. But as Black Lagoon likes to point out, the difference between all the people on this graph is nearly non-existent. Rock fits in in Roanapa, anyone can as long as they have a little bit of luck. Every character we meet in the entire series is either tempted by the city or is outright already in its clutches. And the next parallel, and maybe the most powerful parallel to Rock, Yukio, presents this dichotomy perfectly. Let's get back to what I was talking about before and tie Revy back into all of this. Rock is a hypocrite because he treats Yukio the same way Revy treats him. Revy constantly says that Rock isn't cut out for the type of work they partake in even if she doesn't really mean it like we've already gone over, but Rock doesn't know this and hates that she constantly says this. Especially when she continues to do it even way after it's self-evident that he has the potential to be better at this thing than she even is. Revy is a soldier, not a thinker. She couldn't lead a crime family in the city, but Rock could, with patience and a little push. He directly challenges Balalaika and Chang throughout the show, so it makes sense for him to hate it every time Revy says something like this, but he does the exact same thing to you Yukio and it's beautifully hypocritical. Rock babies Yukio, he tries to protect her when she doesn't want protecting. Maybe she needed it but she didn't ask for it and it's not Rock's place to save her. And as Yukio perfectly points out in that scene when they are alone together in the bowling alley, Rock doesn't actually want to save her because he likes her, even if the show likes to tease the romantic angle between the two of them, he wants to save her because she represents the last remnants of normality Rock has. And remember this is all post twins so Rock doesn't exactly have much normality left. In Rock's mind, she's a representation of normal, peaceful, simple life in Japan. Yukio is presented as the maybe wife Rock could have had if he remained in Japan. The show, as I already mentioned, plays into the romance angle with them initially. But the simple Japanese housewife, the innocent girl untouched by the underworld, is not who Yukio is. It's not who she wanted to be, but Rock thinks he understands Yukio better than Yukio does, just like Revy thinks she knows who Rock is better than Rock does. It's a massive fucked up triangle of projection and manipulation and self pity and hypocrisy, and it's so fucking interesting to watch. And Black Lagoon shines in what I've termed the explosion of emotion scenes. That's exactly what the cigarette kiss scene is, that's exactly what the scene with the standoff with Balalaika is, and that's exactly what the scene in the bowling alley with Rock and Yukio is. It's Yukio calling Rock out on his bullshit hypocrisy, and the moment she tells him that she hates him is so satisfying to me, because in that moment, I hate Rock too, and it's such a human mistake for him to make. How could someone be so laughably unself-aware to not realise that exactly the way he feels towards Yukio is the way Ravi feels towards him? To Rock, Yukio represents a possible love interest in a normal life setting, and all the simple draws that come along with that. And to Revy, Rock represents this same idea. But none of them ever admit any of this. And it just sits in the subtext, perfectly marinating for you to think about forever. And then that final scene where Rock has to get his hypocritical point out before Yukio kills herself is perfect. The piece of shit can't resist, he has to try and convince you here that he was right all along before she impales herself with a fucking samurai sword, and it's all for his pride. It's all to be proven right. Yukio dies and Rock thinks it validates everything he told her. She wasn't cut out for Roanapa, she never reached Roanapa, and in this arc he isn't forced to confront his hypocrisy. Then in Roberta's blood trail we get presented with Fabiola and Garcia, another parallel couple to Rock and Revy. They are a pairing similar to Rock and Revy on the surface, but the arc demonstrates how different the two pairings really are. It does this by making our main characters look like monsters in the faces of these children. Rock does ultimately save them both from going down the same path as he and Revy did, but it's only a byproduct of his ongoing personal feud with Chang. He may save everybody at the end of Roberta's blood trail, but his main motivation was saying fuck you to Chang because Chang attacked his pride. 
Something Chang only did funnily enough because Edda, posing as a CIA agent, attacked his pride because wouldn't you know Chang is another Rock parallel. There's a reason they look nearly identical. Rock didn't save everyone for the moral victory even though he may lie to himself and say that he did, he did it in a foolish attempt to prove Chang wrong. Rock's obsession with saving people that starts with Revy and moves on to Garcia the first time they meet, then on to the twins, then to Yukio, then back to Garcia and Fabiola is born because he couldn't save Revy. Which is funnily enough what Revy actually wanted. Rock just didn't know enough about Revy when he tried originally, and Revy didn't realise what he was trying to do at the time. Rock tried helping Revy by talking to her and trying to understand her, which naturally led him to questioning her morally ambiguous actions with his standard moral virtue. Revy saw this as someone privileged judging her from the outside, not understanding her struggle and how she got into this mess, which really pissed her off. See example 101, the submarine scene. That's where Rock questioned Revy for grave robbing the Nazi soldiers, and she gives that speech I love so much. After that, she goes into a Nazi killing trance and even nearly kills Dutch. Rock hated feeling helpless in that situation, and after he patches things up with Revy after their massive argument in episode 7 that leads to the cigarette kiss, not the scene, but the actual kiss, he tries to overcome his guilt of not being able to save Revy by trying to save Garcia and the twins and Yukio, and he fails a few times and it breaks him, but eventually, at the end of Roberta's blood trail, he wins. He somehow saved Roberta, who murdered tons of American agents, the American agents themselves, and Garcia and Fabiola. But the feeling doesn't resonate with Rock, it doesn't fulfil him, and he can't figure out why, even up to the post credit scene in the final episode. But he feels unfulfilled because at some point in the series, likely after the twins and in Japan, it stopped being about saving people for Rock and started being a pride dick measuring contest with Balalaika and Chang for Rock to flex his abilities. As each encounter chipped away at Rock, he lost sight of his original goal, saving Revy and pursued saving other people as a substitute, only to lose sight of his goal along the way, just like Revy did. She was drawn to Rock because he represented someone who could save her, but as the series progressed, he confronted her with her humanity which made her angry and she slowly lost sight of the goal of using Rock to get out, and the only thing she has left of that original goal is that line she keeps repeating about him not belonging here, because subconsciously, it's her telling herself that he's still her only hope. They both progressively lose themselves and lose their original motivations of saving and wanting to be saved. But that's where it all perfectly comes full circle with both of these two. They actually did want the same thing the entire time. The young girl actually did like the young guy. They didn't have to do this dance, but tragically, just like with the young girl and the young boy, Rock and Revy may never actually admit this to each other. And what we are left with at the end of this series is almost a half step. The last scene we get of the show is a post credit scene after the final episode of the OVAs, in which Revy is seemingly calmed down from nearly killing Rock earlier, and they have a moment where they both shoot using gun hands into the city, looking out from the ship in the dead of night. Symbolically, in this moment, they agree that whatever happens next, they'll do it together, because ultimately, they may not know what the other thinks of them, but they both know themselves that they care about each other, and that they will both feel comfortable facing whatever comes next together, rather than apart. And that's basically the argument for them being the best relationship in anime right there. But there is more if you want to add another entire layer of bullshit to think about, which I didn't even discuss in the video, you could ask the question, is their relationship platonic or romantic? Does running away together entail a romantic relationship? Probably, but not definitely. There's just so much to think about regarding these two before you even get to the romantic or platonic discussion. But most importantly guys, just remember that Black Lagoon is just a dumb action show with nothing to say. Isn't the anime community disgusting? And I refuse to stop until I've done with Black Lagoon what Best Guy ever did with Gurren Lagann. Finally, to conclude, all of this is why this is the best relationship in anime. Better than Spike and Faye, better written than whatever Asuka and Shinji had going on, better than Misato and Kaji, better than Okabe and Kurisu, better than Isaac and Muria, better than Goku and Chi Chi, Vegeta and Bulma, Kushina and Minato, better than Thorfinn and Gudrid, and better than Guts and Cass. Maybe we won't go that far, but I would consider it. But only the manga version of Guts and Casca, so the anime thing still stands. That's how much I love this pairing, it's Guts and Casca levels in my opinion, and they have whole videos talking about that relationship as well. But ultimately none of this storytelling really matters, not to me because the dialogue is so good. I wouldn't have thought about this show and about this pairing as much as I have, or written about this show and this pairing as much as I have, without first being hooked by the great dialogue. Because as I hope I've made abundantly clear, everything in this show stands on the shoulders of the truly medium-defying dialogue. 
dialogue. And to me it's hilariously ironic that anime's greatest export in my opinion is only anime's greatest export for an element that seemingly is antithetical to it being anime. But with all that being said if you enjoyed the video and want to see more the Patreon is the way to go. If you patron and specifically outline that you want more Black Lagoon content it's far more likely for it to get made. Plus five dollar and up patrons get an extra video a month maybe it could be a Black Lagoon video. Who knows but support links in the description below. Thanks.